Greetings, 8th graders. Hello from 7th grade. These are your old 7th grade teachers um, helping you review for your 8th grade SOL. And this is Mrs. Stone speaking for those of you that don't know me or that did not have me last year. And I will be sort of walking you through um, the smart board part of this, of this presentation. You should have a copy of it. Um, and I'll be kind of going through and telling you what to highlight, going through all of the key terms. And then um, Mr. Bonfadini, Ms. Bailey, and I will be coming in for a couple of days into your classroom to go over any questions that you have and do a few hands-on activities with you to help you better understand the material. So if there's anything throughout this spoken part of the presentation, um, as you go through the packet in front of you, please make a little note, put a star next to something that you do have a question about, even write a question down so that you can remember to ask us. And if you need any further explanation, you can always come down and visit us, you know, during lunch, during off team, before school, after school, make arrangements with your eighth grade teacher. I'm sure they don't mind um, if you need further explanation. So we'll get started with our very first section. Section one agenda is on cells, the cell theory, and microscopes, which honestly probably will not uh, talk too much about those other than just why we use them in seventh grade science. And then the next agenda item is life processes. And then finally, cellular organization. So the first thing that we are going to talk about um, is the cell. And as you know, let me get out my little highlighter here, and you should do the same. All living things, biotic. Biotic is the fancy word for all life, all living things. Of course, bio means life in Latin, are made of cells. Cells are the building block of all living things. Just like this year, you've been learning more about atoms being sort of the building block of all matter. In seventh grade, we only focus on life, things that are alive, basically, and cells are the building blocks of all living things. So cells, though, um, can operate as just a you know one-celled organism, but they are made of little tiny structures called organelles. And that's what we're going to go over right now. It's kind of a long list, um, so bear with me. We'll start with the probably most important part of the cell, and that is the nucleus. Now. Another thing we should remember, and we'll talk about this later on in the presentation, is that cells that have a true nucleus are called eukaryotic, um, and we'll talk about that later, like I just said. And some cells, like the bacteria cells that live in your body and kind of all over the place, do not have a true nucleus, and they are prokaryotic. So nuclei, or nu the nucleus of a cell, is kind of like the brain of the cell. It's the control center. And that's because that is where the DNA is located. It's the DNA um, that contains the blueprint for every living thing. It's inside the nucleus, and that's why we call it the brain or the control center. Now, next up is the cytoplasm, which literally means cell fluid. It's the jelly-like fluid inside the cell, kind of gives it its shape, in a sense. Um, the cell membrane is found in both plant and animal cells. It is a semi-permeable um, outer layer of the cell that sort of controls what comes in and what goes out. Now, the cell wall is written in red because it is only found in a plant cell. The cell wall is a rigid outer layer um, that gives the plant cell kind of a boxy shape. Uh, the mitochondria is next, and we say it's the powerhouse of the cell, the mighty mitochondria, but we call it that because there is a chemical reaction that occurs inside of this called cellular respiration, and it's actually that reaction, that chemical reaction, that produces energy for the cell. So we sometimes say the mitochondria produces energy. It's actually that reaction that does it, but it occurs inside the mitochondria. So Mitochondria, energy source. Lysosome is kind of easy to remember because we think of the word lysol, lysosomes, lysol, which um, the lysosomes clean up and recycle old cell parts. Um, ribosomes, I always taught my kids to remember the word rib because ribs equal meat, which equals protein. Ribosomes produce the protein for the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, kind of is like the beltway or a highway around the cell. It's like a transport system. Now, the, the ER can either be rough or smooth. If it is rough, that means little ribosomes are hanging out on it. And if it is smooth, that means it is ribosome-free. The Golgi body or the Golgi apparatus, 
um, is the mailman of the cell, packages and delivers proteins. Um, I always tell my kids to remember that, you know, they can pretend that their mailman's name is Mr. Golgi. It's kind of one way to remember it. The vacuole is pretty easy to remember because it is the storage facility for the cell. And last year we talked about that kind of being our locker here at Bull Run. So a lot of times my students would say, you know, may I go to my vacuole? Just to help them remember that that is their locker where they store things. Um, in the plant cell, the vacuole is very large because it has a lot of water to store and hold. Whereas in the animal cell, there's a bunch of small vacuoles. Now the last two, chloroplast and chlorophyll, are both typed in red as well because they are only found in the plant cell. Um, the chloroplast is where photosynthesis takes place. That's a very important chemical reaction, obviously, and that is where that takes place inside the leaves of plants. The chlorophyll is the green pigment that fills up the chloroplast, so it's inside the chloroplast. And just for fun and old time sake, we'll go ahead and listen to the cell wrap because I know everybody loves it. Okay, let's see. Let's get rid of that. All righty, so hopefully you enjoyed that. Sing and dance along if you know the words. All right, so here's just um, two pictures of both the animal and the plant cell. The animal cell, because it does not have that cell wall, it only has a cell membrane, it can take basically any shape. Animal cells are all different shapes and sizes, whereas plant cells generally are pretty boxy and rectangular. Um, another major difference 
is that the plant cell has one giant vacuole versus a bunch of small vacuoles. And of course, the plant cell has the chloroplasts um, that fills up the chlor, I'm sorry, the chlorophyll inside of the chloroplast. So those are the major differences. Moving along, the cell theory. Okay, so Robert Hooke is a name that we need to know. Remember that, highlight that, check that off. Robert Hooke, he is one of the people that we credit um, with developing one of the first microscopes. The other name that we sort of put with the first microscope is a man named Anton von Leeuwenhoek. But just because they did not have, you know, Twitter and this news media going out on social media and you can get news basically as soon as it happens, back in the 1600s in Europe, we don't really know who actually discovered or developed one of the first microscopes. However, what we do credit Robert Hooke with is actually naming the cell. So that's extremely important. Let's underline that right now. So he named the cell, Robert Hooke. So put a star next to his name. Is that a star? There we go. Okay. He was looking at a piece of cork, which of course cork is a tree, so it is a plant. And he was looking at that under his homemade microscope and he thought to himself, wow, this looks like little cells. Um, what he was looking at, and of course at the time, were tiny boxy rooms that little monks lived in, similar to what a jail cell looks like today. So as what he was looking at, this picture, it looked like a bunch of little jail cells. So what was he actually seeing? Well, he was seeing all of those cell walls. Um, last year, you looked under a microscope at um, an onion skin, and you could see all of the cell walls. So it's very similar to what Robert Hooke was looking at. So he is credited with actually giving us the name cell. Now, fast forward to 200 years later, in the 1800s, we have three scientists, um, Schleiden, Schwann, and Virchow, it's like the Germans, you have to say their names like with a really thick German accent, it just makes it more fun. So Schleiden was a botanist, which is a man who, a scientist that studies plants, and one day he was like, oh, all plants are made of cells. And his colleague, um, Schwann, he was, um, well, he studied all kinds of science, but he studied animals and he said, I agree with you, Schleiden, and I also want to add to that that all animals are made of cells. Finally, Virchow came along, and because these two were having a disagreement about this, and it's Virch Virchow that came along and said that um, all cells come from other cells. They don't just come out of nowhere. They have to actually be reproduced by a pre-existing cell. So the three scientists that developed the cell theory were Schleiden, Schwann, and Virchow. Can't really highlight this because my background is yellow, but there they are. You can highlight that, put a star next to it, whatever. Schleiden, Schwann, and Virchow were the cell theory guys, whereas Robert Hooke was more of a pioneer. He was 200 years earlier. Oh, wait, I actually have a video on this too. This one's a little longer, but it's the cell theory story. So let me go ahead and open that for you. Open Sesame. All right, there we go. All right, lovely. Love the ads. Let's skip that ad. There we go. Great. Okay.
So once again, the cell theory states, and this is very important, all living things are made of cells. All cells come from pre-existing cells or other cells. And cells are the basic structure and function of all living things. So even though it's simple, you really need to review these three bullets right here. The cell theory is very important to the SOL. All right, moving on. Life processes. So in order to be alive, to be a biotic creature, a biotic organism on this planet, or any planet for that matter, um, living things need to be able to do all of these seven life processes. And the way we remember them is by remembering the acronym Mrs. NERG. So those seven life processes are movement, respiration, sensitivity, nutrition, excretion, reproduction, and growth. Mrs. NERG. So these are just a few of the ones right here. We have excretion, which can be anything from, yes, going to the bathroom, but also sweating, exhaling. Um, this one right here, we could say it's growth. Every living thing grows from starting out as a single cell um, through its life cycle all the way until death. This one right here is movement. Yes, even plants move. They actually grow toward their light source sometimes, or they grow up toward the sun because obviously they need the sun to survive. Right here we have um, the apple being eaten is nutrition. All living things need to be able to get nutrients. Um, for animals we have to consume our food. If you're a plant you can create your own food but you still need nutrients from the soil. Nitrogen, um, water, and obviously they use the sun's energy to create their glucose. So it's still a nutrient. Now down here we have reproduction. So it's not just in human beings, but every little, every living thing reproduces itself in order to keep the species going because without reproduction, the species will go extinct. Um, this one right here is respiration, which we think of as a gas exchange. So in animals, that means oxygen in and CO2 out. That's a gas exchange. Whereas in plants, it's CO2 in and oxygen out. They are the opposite of us. And then finally, this plant right here, we could say it's moving, and it is, um, but we could also say that it is being sensitive to its environment. It's reacting to a stimulus. Um, in this case, the sun is a stimulus, and it's actually reacting to its surroundings by moving toward it because it's trying to get what, it's need, what it needs. So let me stop there for a minute. So the next video I'm going to show you is just like a trailer, almost like a movie trailer for the introduction to the characteristics of life. Um, for some reason, if you can't hear it very well, Frank Gregorio does a bunch of these videos. They're all really well done. He uses a lot of the um, video and pictures from the Discovery Channel series Life and Planet Earth. So you may recognize some of these from shows that you've seen on those channels. So let me go ahead and make it a big screen. Let's see if we can hear it. Turn up the volume.
Okay, so cellular organization. So remember I told you a minute ago that all living things are made of cells and everything starts with a cell, including humans. We started off as one cell before those cells kept dividing and dividing until we became this incredibly intense uh, multicellular uh, organ or multicellular organism. But some living things are only made of one cell. Those are unicellular. Of course, uni, the prefix means one. So all living things at least have to ha have to have one cell, okay? Now, those cells working together in groups form tissues like muscle tissue, skin tissue, um, liver tissue, brain tissue, and then those tissues working together form an organ, like a heart. The heart is made of heart muscle tissue, blood tissue, skin tissue, um, lots of different tissues working together. Now, organs combine together to form an organ system, like a circulatory system. And in this case, the circulatory system is made up of all kinds of arteries, veins, blood vessels, capillaries, and of course, the heart muscle. And then finally, all of those systems working together complete the final organism, in this case, a human being. So once again, cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, organism. Um, last year, my kids, we did like a chant, like cells, or, you know, C-T-O-O-O. -O -O. So we can um, have the teachers practice that in class, or we can practice it with you when we see you um, and do that chant together. So C-T-O-O-O. -O -O. Um, sometimes we even said C-T-3-O, like C-3-P-O on Star Wars. All right, moving on. This is section... Three, I think so. Section section three agenda. So next up, we're going to talk about two big chemical reactions. And see, now that you're eighth graders, these cell or these chemical reactions probably make a lot more sense to you, because this year you even balanced chemical equations. So reviewing these two cellular respiration and photosynthesis equations is like a piece of cake, especially because they're basically the same thing. They're just backwards. And then we're going to talk about cell transport, and then we'll get into DNA and the cell cycle. All right, cellular respiration. Does this look familiar? Um, first of all, we already talked about this. It takes place in the mitochondria. Remember I said the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell? It converts the food that we eat into energy. And that food that we eat is, of course, the glucose that we get from the plant. All right, so mitochondria is where cellular respiration takes place. It converts food into energy. Um, the energy, of course, is ATP. So it occurs in animals and plants. It occurs in all living things. Plants generally will respirate at night because, of course, during their day, they're busy photosynthesizing. So here is the equation again. Um, I'm not sure if you'll have to have this memorized for the SOL or just be able to recognize it. So either way, Think about this. Common sense. Think about yourself. You breathe in oxygen. Animals, we breathe in oxygen. 6O2. Plus, not just oxygen, but what do we need? We need food. Glucose. The food that we eat is glucose. And that big it's a big molecule too. C6H12O6. It's a carbohydrate. CHO. There it is. Now, of course, this year you know that the arrow sign means yields. So, again, this is not technically equals because, as you know, we started off with oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and we end up with hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. And, of course, energy is the byproduct as well. So, this yields. If we breathe in oxygen and eat food, we actually turn that into six molecules of water, H2O. Where's my highlighter? So it yields water and then carbon dioxide, 6CO2. Well, what do we do with that? We give it off. We don't want it. Let's see. Draw an arrow. That goes out of our body. It is a toxic gas. We exhale every time we breathe or exhale out. We give off CO2. Whenever we talk or if you blow up a balloon, it's CO2 that is leaving your nose and your mouth. Now, lastly, the whole reason for this reaction, energy adenosine triphosphate. That is what's created, again, in the mitochondria, and it's the energy that our cells use, okay? Um, you can't even, like, have your heart beating, your eyes blinking, things that you don't think take any kind of energy at all. 
do require energy just to function. Your brain needs a ton of energy. Um, right now, a lot of you are growing, so you're probably always starving, and that all makes sense. You need a lot of food, a lot of glucose to make a lot of energy, which you need to grow. And if you're in sports or you're very active, that's another reason why you need to eat a lot of food because you are busy making all of this energy and you're using it up. Humans, the way our metabolism works is that we have to eat three, four, five times a day in order to keep the energy amounts going to keep our bodies functioning. So another part of this is when you feel tired or sluggish, it's your body's way of saying that you don't have a lot of energy left. You need to eat. All right. Now, the exact opposite of the cellular respiration equation is photosynthesis. This is what plants are doing inside the chloroplast when the sun is shining. Um, if it were not for this reaction right here, there would be no animal life on the planet. Okay, this, photo, this reaction, this photosynthesis reaction is probably one of the most important chemical reactions on planet Earth as we know it. So plants are the opposite. They take in CO2 from the atmosphere, which is good because remember, it's poisonous to animals. They take in the CO2. So it's, plants are good to have around. They actually take in this bad you know, gas mixture from the atmosphere, this combination. So 6CO2 plus water. Think about if you have a plant, what you have to give it. You need to water it. So it needs CO2 from the air. Six water, six H2Os from the from rain or from whatever. And then, of course, the main thing here is its energy source. You need sunlight energy. Okay, plants need sunlight. And it turns it into, inside the chloroplast, turns it into this big glucose molecule, which is the food for the plant. This is another reason why we call plants producers, is they produce the food for the entire planet. And that food is broken into a glucose molecule. Once again, C6H12O6. Now plants, thank goodness, another reason we love them, they produce oxygen as a byproduct, but guess what? They don't need it. They give it off. They literally kind of breathe it out back into the atmosphere where we get it. That is why plants are also good to have around because we need the oxygen and the food that they produce. It's a perfect cycle. Here it is again. You can almost see that this is a backwards reaction. Instead of ATP energy, plants use the sun. They take in CO2. They take in water. They give off, or they create, sorry, they create glucose, and they give off oxygen. Okay? If we look at photosynthesis, it's the opposite of cellular respiration. Animals take in oxygen. We eat food to get glucose. We produce ATP, which is the same thing. It's just a different form of energy. We produce water and we give off CO2. So there's your two very important chemical reactions. All right, moving on. Actually, stop there and I'm going to see if I can show you this photosynthesis wrap.
So next up, we're going to talk about cellular transport. Um, you may remember this. Well, let me just ask you this. I feel like this year when you guys had your pancake day, um, we all knew about it, even though I did not talk to any of your teachers. But around 10 a.m., 11 a.m., the, uh, the wafting, the smell of the delicious chocolate chip pancakes kind of came down our hallway, and we all knew that you were cooking something yummy down there. And you think to yourselves, okay, how did we know that? And the answer to that question is simply diffusion. All of the molecules from those chocolate chip pancakes were concentrated in your room to the source of the pancakes. But nothing likes crowd, even molecules. They don't like to stay jam-packed together. They like to spread out and find their own space. So that's exactly what they did. They diffused around the building. So a few hours later, those chocolate chip pancake molecules were all over the building and everybody could smell what a delicious lab you guys were doing. So once again, diffusion, and this occurs, of course, inside the cell. Things need to go inside the cell and out of the cell constantly. So, for example, water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, all of these things need to come and go. And it's the cell membrane that allows things to come and go. So if there's like too much water inside the cell, the cell membrane will start to move water out of the cell to reach equilibrium, which means everything is balanced. So diffusion is the movement of molecules, whatever they are, through a semi-permeable membrane, which again is that cell membrane, and it goes from an area that is highly concentrated, meaning jam-packed in your room, this, the scent of the pancakes, to an area that is low concentrated, meaning like my room. Um, down here in the 1400 hallway, there were no pancake molecules to begin with, so of course those molecules want to spread out to where there is more space. And that's what low concentration means. It doesn't require any energy. Those molecules are happy to do it. And it's the same thing. It goes both ways. We don't do anything that smells good in our room, though. The one thing that you could probably smell that was not good was the squid dissection. The day that we do that, first period, it starts off really bad just in my room. But by 6 block at the end of the day, it's bad all over the place. And that's because the same thing. Those molecules, the smell from the squid, they go from an area that is highly concentrated to low concentration. Now, the analogy I used with my kids last year was... A sliding board or if you ski if you go skiing down a hill if you sled down a hill if you go tubing down a hill you start off up high okay high concentration and you go from high concentration down low to the bottom and it requires no energy from you you just sit there you don't do a thing okay you just enjoy the ride you let gravity take over uh, in a minute, though, I'm going to talk to you about how sometimes we have to go from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. We have to go up the hill and think about if you have to climb a really big hill, like in a, if you're sleigh riding or if you're skiing and you had to walk back up that hill, it requires a lot of energy. That's something a little different. Here's another example we did in class. Um, we had a beaker filled with water. We added a few drops of highly concentrated food dye or food coloring. At first, it starts off very highly concentrated, and eventually, it diffuses. It spreads out. It gets to an equilibrium point in the water so that the entire glass of water is now all one uniform color. Okay? Osmosis. All right, so this is really nothing new. Osmosis is simply the diffusion of water. Let's highlight the word water. Water, water, water. Water is so important to life. Water is so necessary to all living things that we give it a special name when it moves. That's it. That's all osmosis is. It's the diffusion, which is what we just talked about, of water. All right? So same thing. If you put a bunch of raisins which is where the water has all sort of diffused out of. They're dehydrated. And we put those raisins back in water. 
So here's the high concentration of water. The raisins are obviously low concentrated. They don't have any water. Well, I shouldn't say that. They have some water left, but a lot of it has left. And if we put those raisins back in, all the water is going to go where? Into the raisin. And guess what? They puff right back up. They actually can look like little grapes again, but they don't taste like them, so don't eat them. Now, active transport. This is a rare occasion, okay? So active transport is a type of cell transport, though, where very rarely, like I just talked about, we have to go from low to high. Active transport is going from an area that is low to an area that is already highly concentrated. And because of this, it requires energy. That's the thing to highlight here. Oh, my highlighter doesn't show up on the green. Let's underline it. Mm -hmm. Do -do. There we go. Underline that. It requires energy. Active transport goes from low, sorry, to high. Look at all my crazy lines. Low to high, and it requires energy. Here's how you remember this. If you have to climb from low to high, it's going to require a lot of energy from you. You'll probably be sweating. All right. An example, plant root cells may already have a lot of water already in their cells. And they store it in those big vacuoles. Remember that? So sometimes, even though they already have a high concentration of water, they will still move water in from the soil. So the water will go from low to high. And they need energy. They have to use up some of the energy they create for themselves in order to do this. All right, moving on. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA, let's draw a line for this. D, deoxy, ri I'm sorry, ribo, deoxyribonucleic N acid. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Say that out loud. All right, there you go. Nice job. Okay, so DNA, so important, highly important. Holy cow. Underline it, highlight it, whatever you need to do. It is found in the nucleus. That's where it is. That's why I told you earlier the nucleus is the control center of the cell, and it's the control center because the DNA is there telling it what to do. The DNA is the blueprint. It's your instructions. Every living thing has DNA. Even last year, remember we pulled the DNA out of a strawberry. Strawberries have DNA. Now, here's the first time you're going to see this word in print. Eukaryotic. A eukaryotic cell has the DNA inside the nucleus. Okay? Now, DNA has four nitrogen. Let's underline the word nitrogen. Four nitrogen bases. This is easy to remember. Adenine always pairs with thymine, and cytosine always pairs with guanine. So it's just four bases to remember. That's it. That's all you have to worry about. A, T, C, G. Um, apples grow on trees. This is how we remembered it last year. Cars go in the garage. Adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Those are your four nitrogen bases that make up the DNA molecule. Let's take a look at what it looks like. Here it is. It is referred to as a double helix, sometimes called a twisted ladder, which I still think would be a very cool rock band name. So if you ever become a famous rock musician, um, please give me credit for that. Twisted ladder, double helix, spiral staircase. This is what your DNA looks like. Okay, scientifically we say it's a double helix. Now, we just talked about this. The steps of the ladder, the parts you would climb on, those are your nitrogen bases. A, T, C, and G. Now, the sides of the ladder, these parts right here, okay, those are made up of a combination of sugar and phosphates. And then some of you might even remember, if you are um, really good at biology, that these nitrogen bases are held together with hydrogen, hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds. I don't think they'll ask you that on the SOL, but what I do think you need to know is double helix and these nitrogen bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Review that. Okay. Now, the scientists that are credited with creating the model of the DNA molecule, they got the Nobel Prize for it. Does anybody remember their names? Uh, colleagues? James Watson. That's this guy right here on the left. And Francis Crick, this guy on the right. We think James Watson is still alive. We looked him up last year. However, Francis Crick was much older than James Watson, so he died a few years ago. Um, this was in like 1961. 
So very impressive um, to come up with that technology all the way back then. Now, these two guys, believe it or not, I think should give some credit to this woman who in the 1950s used X-ray crystallography to actually project an image of the DNA molecule onto an X-ray. And this was the actual picture of it. And her name, I'm sure some of you will remember this, but it was Rosalind Franklin. And she... Um, gets a lot of credit for that and also I think it's very cool that in the 1950s when a lot of American women were housewives um, she was a fancy dancy scientist so good for her so again James Watson Francis Crick model of a DNA molecule Rosalind Franklin used an x-ray to project an image of the DNA molecule now why does the DNA make a copy of itself this happens during the cell cycle which we're going to talk about in a few minutes um, the DNA during its lifespan inside of your cells, inside the nucleus, um, actually makes a copy of itself to prepare for cell division. So why does it do this? So that every new cell that is created has an exact copy of that genetic material. Remember, this DNA molecule is super duper long and every thing about you, your eye color, your hair color, your height, even facets of your personality are encoded in genes in this DNA, okay? And so every cell, every skin cell, every brain cell, every heart cell, every muscle cell has an exact copy of your DNA in it. So the DNA makes a copy of itself so that when you get some new cells, when your skin cells die and you've got fresh ones ready to go, you want the exact DNA that was in the old cell. You just want a fresher model. So the DNA makes a copy of itself so that every new cell will have an exact copy of your genes. Now, chromosomes is another important word to know. Chromosomes, I can highlight this, it'll show up. Chromosomes are just wound up DNA. That's all it is. If we took DNA and wound it up really tight, it would form something called a chromosome. All right, and again, the DNA contains all the genetic material for any organism, for you, for your cat, for your dog, for your horse, for your fish, uh, even the apple that you might eat for lunch. The DNA contains the genetic material for all of those organisms. And humans may have as many as 25,000 to 50,000 traits alone, all wound up in that DNA. So on each little segment of the DNA is what is a gene and that gene might be for your hair color here may be a gene for your eye color your height your nose shape the shape of your eyelashes your eyebrows whatever if we wind up all that DNA it forms that characteristic X shaped chromosome now and the chromosomes are all inside the nucleus of your cells and just so you know human beings does anybody remember how many chromosomes we have 46 is the number right there. 46 chromosomes in every single nucleus of our cells. Okay, so the cell cycle is the ne next thing that we're going to talk about. Um, just a second ago, I told you that every cell in your body, which is like 100 trillion cells in the human body alone, goes through a life cycle. Um, just like every living thing goes through a life cycle, every cell goes through a life cycle. And uh, once a cell is created, it spends about 90% of its life in the first stage, which is called interphase. Now, during interphase, this whole part right here is interphase, okay? So about 90% of the cell cycle. And let's see, let's highlight that again. 90% of the cell cycle. Now, in interphase, the cell grows, okay, just like every living thing has to grow. Remember, it makes a copy of the DNA so that every new cell, um, when it goes through cell division, will get an exact replica of the DNA molecule or molecules, and then it prepares for cell division. So that's what happens during interphase. Then in stage two, which is the mitotic phase, mitosis, um, that is where the cell begins to divide and you actually end with two new nuclei. So mitosis um, has four phases and that would be, let's see, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And at the end of telophase, you have two new nuclei, each 
with its own identical set of DNA. And then finally, the last stage of the cell cycle is very brief. It's not even on this pie chart, and it should be. Um, we'll draw a little line where it should be. It's so brief. This would be cytokinesis would be right there. Let me draw an arrow to it. You can put that on your paper. Right there is cytokinesis. Oops, that's way too big to write. Let's make that really, really small. Cyto, oh, that's really small. Kinesis. Let me make that a tiny bit bigger. Whoops. Okay, cytokinesis is that final, um, like basically 1% of the entire cell cycle where the cell kind of pinches apart into two new identical cells. Um, and then, so those are the three stages, interphase, mitosis, and cytokinesis. Now, uh, let's talk about mitosis in more detail. It occurs in all, here's a word for you, somatic cells. Somatic cells are body cells, okay? Soma, soma, actually, soma by itself actually means body in Latin. So they are all the body cells, every cell that makes up the bulk of your body. So that's pretty much everything. Skin cells, hair cells, liver cells, bone cells. Now, we already said this once, but human somatic cells have how many chromosomes? You said 46. You were right. 46 chromosomes. That is our magic number. Um, every organism sort of has a different number of chromosomes, but all of our skin cells in the nucleus of our cells have 46 chromosomes, okay? And then guess what? Every liver cell has those exact same 46 chromosomes. Every bone cell has those exact same 46 chromosomes. Now, mitosis, getting back to that, let's underline the word mitosis. This is stage two. But it's kind of a really important stage because this is where the cell begins to divide. And like I said, it has four phases. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. We remember that in my class, please make a taco. I think it was a Tuesday and we were talking about Taco Tuesday. So please make a taco. And these are kind of pictures of what is happening. Um, in prophase, the chromosomes condense. In metaphase, they line up in the middle. That's not a very good picture. In anaphase, they start, oh wait, that was prophase. Erase that. Sorry. Metaphase, they line up in the middle. In anaphase, they start to pull away from each other, A for away. And telophase, two new nuclei. And you can see how in telophase, it kind of looks like the, it looks like an eight. Okay, the cell has not completely pinched apart yet, um, but there's two new nuclei and the chromosomes go back to normal. And then in cytokinesis, these two cells right here actually do pinch apart. Now, not to confuse you, but there is a very special type of cell division that is only for the reproductive cells in your body, and it is called meiosis. Now, meiosis only, underline this again, only occurs in sperm and egg cells, only occurs in reproductive cells. So everything else is mitosis. Meiosis produces sperm and egg cells. And you know what? It doesn't just split once. It splits twice. Meiosis one, meiosis two. The good news is the steps are the same. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And then prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, telophase two. Now, here's the biggest difference. At the bottom, at the end of meiosis, how many cells do you see? We've got one, two, three, and four. Whereas in mitosis, you have only two daughter cells, and they are exactly the same. They are identical. In meiosis, we have four non-identical cells. They are not the same at all. Let me show you. This is what this is. So, they're not the same because they are, they produce something called a haploid cell, which means they have half the number of chromosomes. At the end of mitosis, these two identical cells still have 46 chromosomes. Let's see, let's write that on here. These two right here, I'm going to erase the one and the two, not to confuse you even more. Let's erase that. So, at the end of mitosis, like I've told you, we have two identical cells that have 46 chromosomes. 
at the end of meiosis, okay, again, only occurs in sperm and egg cells, we have four unidentical cells that each have 23 chromosomes, or half, half the number, okay, half of 46 is 23, there's your math lesson for the day. And why is this? Because, guess what, here's a sperm cell, that's an actual sperm cell that's been magnified, it only has 23 chromosomes from dad. The males produce the sperm cell. So the male only gives away 23 of his 46 chromosomes. And then mom has the egg cell. And in that egg cell, again, only 23 or half of mom's chromosomes DNA. And again, 23 plus 23. When the sperm fertilizes the egg cell, you end up with a brand new complete set of human DNA which is called a zygote, and that is your 46 chromosomes. And then that zygote, a while back I told you you started as one cell, and you did. This was the cell we all start out as. It's called a zygote. 46 complete cells there. I'm sorry, 46 complete chromosomes. And then this cell right here will start to divide millions of, millions of times until the, um, the fetus, the new baby, is ready to be born. And then those cells never stop dividing until death. Your cells divide from the time that a zygote is created until death. Cells divide and make new cells constantly. So meiosis, only sperm and egg cells, only produces haploid cells, four of them, one, two, three, four, and that is because the haploid cells come together and produce a new human being, or it could be anything new that's living that sexually reproduces. This could be a frog sperm and a frog egg, and then you have new frogs. It could be a dog and, you know, male dog, female dog, new puppy. It could be anything that's alive that reproduces sexually. You've got a sperm cell and an egg cell, and that is what creates a new living thing. So that is the difference. All right, I think we're, at, this is section three. The last section was section two. Um, so we're going to get into section three, which is talking all about genetics and heredity and evolution. Okay, section three, um, genetics and heredity and evolution, like I already said. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, um, you know, genetics and heredity are the science of studying genes, and a heredity is more about how those genes get passed on from parent to offspring and how traits are inherited and we just talked about meiosis and we talked about sexual reproduction and how you need to have a sperm cell with half of dad's DNA and an egg cell that has half of mom's DNA so biologically you are 50% of each of your parent but we want to talk about why certain traits show up in offspring and why others don't and how those genes get passed down and sometimes can show up later in generations, you know, 50 years down the road. So it's really a fascinating branch of science. And the more we are able to learn about DNA and where and we're able to study the human genome and actually isolate genes, we've come to so many advances in medicine and determining if you have a gene for breast cancer or heart disease um, or any other kind of ailment, it's nice to be able to know that so you can learn to treat it early on and also just be, you know, making sure you're living a healthy lifestyle. So if you have a gene for lung cancer, for example, and you know that early in life, then you will protect yourself from things that we know cause lung cancer like smoking or inhaling dangerous um, chemicals and things like that. So, like I said, really fascinating branch of science. It's very exciting. But starting from the beginning... Um, we just talk about the definition. Heredity is the passing of traits from parent to offspring. And then we talk about sort of the father of genetics, the father of heredity, as Gregor Mendel, the Austrian monk who um, devoted his life to breeding pea plants. And I mean like 30,000 pea plants in his lifetime. And noticed that certain traits showed up in the daughter plants um, and other traits stayed hidden for several generations and then would show up again which was even more baffling um, initially so it's um, and he you know we talked about why did he study pea plants and not human beings 
and I'm sure you can probably figure this out or you remember this, but pea plants grow very quickly. You can have several generations in just a few months' time, whereas with humans, you can only study about three or four generations at most in one's lifetime. Um, human generations are, you know, on average about 25 to 30 years before you can really study the offspring um, and the grandchildren. So pea plants reproduce and grow a lot faster. Now, a key word here that I feel like kids always forget is the word allele. Circle that, highlight it. The word allele is just a form of the same gene. So, for example, like think about your eye color. Think about your parents' eye color. You have an allele for eye color. Let's say you have brown eyes. Um, you got an allele for eye color from each, your mom and your dad. Remember, they give you half their genes. Um, your mom gave you an allele for eye color for maybe she had a brown eye gene to give and maybe dad had a blue eye gene to give. Um, and then you ended up with brown eyes. So an allele is just like, you know, um, and like an eye color gene, but you get one from each parent, okay? Um, and then a Punnett square, and we're going to practice with a lot of those when um, Miss Bailey and Mr. Bonfadini and I come into the classroom with you. We'll actually practice some of these, so I'm just going to mention it right now. Punnett square is used to predict, underline the word predict, because it is not, um, you know, a definite outcome. It's just a predicting tool. It doesn't mean this is what's going to happen. It's like a percentage, like you have a 50-50 shot of having, you know, blue eyes based on your parents' traits. So it's just a prediction tool. It's fun. It's kind of fun to see, you know, what possibilities that, you know, you have and what your siblings might have. So, and then what your future children might have. This is what a Punnett square looks like. We talked about um, the words dominant and recessive. Dominant traits um, they block other alleles. These are the ones that tend to show up on a person if they are present. Dominant traits block any other alleles. They are dominant. That's what they do. Brown eyes is dominant in humans. Dark hair is dominant in humans. Dark skin is dominant in humans. Recessive traits are covered up by the dominant trait and they will stay hidden. But you could still be carrying a recessive trait in your DNA. It's just hidden there. But you may have the ability to pass on that recessive trait to your future offspring. So it's very possible, for example, um, to have two brown-eyed parents and end up with a blue-eyed baby. It's because both parents were carrying that recessive trait, but they, it just didn't show up on them. All right, so dominant traits block recessive traits. Um, the only way to have a recessive trait show up is if you don't have a dominant allele present, okay? Let's do this Punnett square really quickly. Let me get some letters here. All right, so up here we have what is called um, a heterozygous, um, what is this, black fur? Capital B um, is black fur. That's the dominant trait. And the lowercase b, oh, here it is. The lowercase b is the recessive trait, which is white fur. This is in rabbits, okay? So the mom has black fur. She's big B, little b, okay? As long as she has a capital B, then the dominant trait, of course, blocks everything else. Then this mom has black fur. And so does dad. Dad is also what we call heterozygous black fur. Hetero means different. You'll notice that these alleles are different. One is capital, one is lowercase. They are not the same. They are different. Same with dad, heterozygous, capital B, lowercase b. So again, they are not the same. So then what goes in this box? Can I write in this? I think I can. Yes, dad gives a capital black furred allele. And guess what? Bring this down. So does mom. So... The genotype, which is the symbol or letters, is big B, big B, two capital Bs. And then we go up here to our chart. Capital B means what color? Black fur. So this little baby right here is going to be homozygous black fur. Homozygous, the prefix homo, once again, means the same. These two alleles are exactly the same. They are both capital letters, big B, big B homozygous black fur. All right, let's go on to this one. Dad contributes a capital B, right, over here. Mom contributes a lowercase, whoops, 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 whoops. Lowercase, shoot, there we go. Lowercase B. B 
Big B, little B. Heterozygous, however, mom, I'm sorry, this baby, why can't I move that? Oh, well, is still black fur because that dominant allele is present. All right, down here, dad gives a lowercase b, mom gives a capital B, capital B, lowercase b. This is a heterozygous offspring, hetero because they're both different, big B, little b. But because that capital B is there, it is black fur also. So black fur, black fur, black fur. Then we get to the last little offspring. Dad contributes a lowercase b. Mom contributes a lowercase b. And guess what? Lowercase b, white fur. No dominant allele to cover this up. So this is two lowercase b's, homozygous, recessive. Okay, homozygous, recessive, white fur. So the genotype, once again, would be the letters, big B, little b, big B, big B, etc. The phenotype would be how I described each of these. Okay, if I wrote out black fur, that's the phenotype. It's how I physically describe it. PH for phenotype, PH for physical description. Black fur, black fur, black fur, white fur. Those are the phenotypes. That's a lot of information on one page, but keep on moving. Oh, this is practice that we're going to do with you. This YouTube clip right here, we're going to do that with you. Those are the furry families, the little bunny rabbits. All right, so we can do this cross together. Um, let's see. Can I write in this one? Yes. All right, so um, what genotype would go in this box? I'll pause for answers. If you said big B, big B, you were right. Mom contributes capital B, dad contributes capital B. What's the phenotype here? It would be black fur, capital B, B means black fur. All right, in this one, what's the genotype? If you said big B, big B, you are right again, okay? Because um, dad contributed a big B, and mom contributed a big B as well. So we are again homozygous for black fur. Then down here, this offspring has, oh, go ahead actually. I'll pause for answers. What's the genotype in this box? If you said big B, little b, you are right. Mom contributes the capital B, dad contributes the lowercase b. That is heterozygous, heterozygous. Black, still black fur, but heterozygous. And then the last offspring, go ahead and tell me what that genotype is. If you said big B, little b, you are right again. Big B from mom, little b from dad. Again, heterozygous, black. So genotype is big B, little b. Phenotype is black. So then you could say, well, what's the percentage? What are the chances of these two rabbits Having offspring with black fur, 100% chance. There's basically no chance of these two rabbits having a white fur baby. Okay, every single baby that they have will always have black fur. Now, their grandchildren could have white fur because that recessive white fur gene is there. It just didn't show up on their children. Okay, moving on. Oh, we can do this with you um, when we come into your classroom. So we'll save that for later. Okay, now, when the DNA replicates and makes a copy of itself way back in cell division to prepare to, you know, have a copy of the DNA in each new cell, sometimes, very rarely, well, actually it happens probably more often than you think, little tiny changes occur in DNA replication. And there are other ways that these things can happen, but that's probably one of the most common. Changes in the genes, changes in the DNA are called mutations, okay? Now, some mutations can be helpful, okay? And that's kind of how evolution has occurred. Some are harmful, and some are completely neutral. They have no effect. Now, for example, here is an albino deer, um, which is a mutation. Now, think about that. Would that be helpful, harmful, or, you know, no effect or unaffected? 
And obviously the answer is it would be harmful because the deer has lost a major adaptation, which is camouflage. And is easier to spot by hunters, by prey, I'm sorry, by predators. Um, so it's just a, a negative mutation. This right here, the two-headed snake, that is also a negative harmful mutation. Um, they do have two operating brains in one body and it's just been proven, believe it or not, you'd think two brains would be better than one, but it's not when they have the same body. So that is a harmful, ineffective mutation. Now this one right here, two different eye color in humans. Um, I don't know if you know anybody that has this, but it's unaffected. Uh, it doesn't affect their vision. Um, I think it's kind of cool looking, so um, that tends to be a neutral mutation. All right, genetic engineering. Um, we can play this video for you when we come in. Um, this is where scientists have actually figured out a way to take the DNA. Remember I said that, you know, with the study of genetics, we've been able to isolate certain genes, um, like figure out where the gene is for, you know, brain cancer, find the gene for, you know, color of fur or texture of fur for a mouse. We can isolate a gene. And let's say we want to transfer that gene into the DNA of another living thing to alter it, to genetically modify it, that is called genetic engineering or genetic modification. Um, this is where scientists have figured out a way to cut and paste pieces of DNA from one organism to another. Now, one of the biggest ways that we use this in science is genetically modified foods. But if your mom and dad are into reading labels and overall good health, they may be avoiding GMO foods, which are genetically modified organism, because they might not know what the long-term effects of these scientific, you know, sort of creations are. They haven't been around long enough to know if they have a long-term effect on the human body. Um, in some ways, it's actually beneficial. Scientists have been able to create like a tomato that doesn't freeze at 32 degrees by inserting the gene from a fish that lives in Arctic waters um, that keeps it from freezing. They've isolated that antifreeze gene from the fish, inserted it into the DNA of a tomato, and now your tomato doesn't freeze. It doesn't taste like fish. It doesn't have fish DNA. It just simply has an antifreeze gene naturally. Um, the same can be done for certain vegetables so that they can avoid having pesticides sprayed all over them. So it's like, what's more harmful, chemicals sprayed on top of your corn or a gene in the DNA that keeps bugs from eating the corn? So there are some, you know, obviously pluses and minuses of genetic engineering, um, and it's a fascinating part of science, but there's always going to be more studies that will come out later on about the effects of genetic engineering. Okay, evolution. Let's watch this evolution trailer. Evolution, by the way, is a theory, 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 not a law, a theory that suggests that we originated from a common ancestor, not necessarily the ape itself, although we, you know, have a lot of ape-like qualities as modern-day humans, but it just suggests that we originated from a common ancestor and that everything on Earth originated from a single organism. So let's watch this trailer. It's really good. And let's see, let me pause that and so you can see the whole thing.
Okay, so good video, good trailer um, that talks about how evolution is simply a change over a very long time. And if you remember the scientist who is who we know and still um, recognize that developed the theory of evolution by means of natural selection, of course, is Charles Darwin. Okay, and he started his journey as a very young man um, back in England, and he went aboard the HMS Beagle, that was the name of the ship, sailed for five years um, around the earth, focusing much of his time on a little group of islands off of the coast of Ecuador in South America in the Pacific Ocean. And he spent a lot of his time noticing that on each island of the Galapagos Islands, there were so many different types of animals and different types of life that he did not see anywhere else on the planet. So after his five-year journey and, you know, taking copious notes and drawing lots of pictures about everything that he explored as he traveled, he went back to England and began developing his theory of evolution by natural selection, which wasn't published for, you know, many years later. His main theory was, is that he believed that organisms that are fit to survive will. They will survive and then they will pass on those favorable traits to their offspring. So if they have really well adapted um, bodies or well adapted environments, if they are fit enough to survive in their environment, they will keep on surviving and they will live long enough to pass on those good traits to their babies and so on and so on. And we sort of call this survival of the fittest. Those that cannot adapt they don't have the adaptations. They can't adapt to the change. They will and they have gone extinct. A little fun fact is that 99% of everything that's ever lived on Earth has already gone extinct. So maybe when Miss um, Bailey and Mr. Bonfadini and I come in, we can show you the, some of the um, brain pops. Now, adaptations are a key component of being able to survive long enough to pass on your traits. So some of the important adaptations that we talked about last year, artificial bigness, which is making yourself look bigger than you really are, or even like a school of fish. Um, you've seen that in Nemo. You've probably seen it in movies, the fish like sardines and things like that that swim as huge groups. They actually appear to be a large, uh, larger fish to sort of fool their predators. Camouflage, if you can't be seen, you won't be found as food. So there is a toad right here. I don't know if you can see that. Now, um, another example we talked about was that we know of, we have evidence of evolution. We have evidence of things that used to live on the planet that did go extinct because they couldn't survive. And one of those, of course, is the short-necked giraffe. Now, it, the only, so there has to be other factors other than the giraffes that sort of had a mutation and developed extra vertebrae to make their necks longer could reach a food supply that no other animal could. So they were able to survive maybe a very crowded savanna in the grasslands of Africa where there was a lot of competition for food closer to the ground. So these longer-necked giraffes had an advantage over their short-necked relatives. Now, we know that the short-necked giraffe did used to exist. We have um, fossil evidence to prove it, but we also know it's extinct. It doesn't exist anymore. And what's left, what giraffes do you see walking the earth? The ones with longer necks. So that is an example of an animal that could not adapt to a changing environment. Um, there had to have been food on the ground at some point because baby giraffes would die if that were the case. But I think it's a matter of maybe the savanna just got very crowded with other herbivores that grazed away all of the food supply that was closer to the ground. And these adult short-necked giraffes just couldn't adapt fast enough to changing conditions. So that is how evolution can actually eliminate an animal or an organism that can't evolve fast enough. Evidence we have, remember this word? Homologous structures. Homo, there's the prefix homo again, which means the same. Homologous structures are like basically the same shape and they're used for the same purpose. We also have fossils. Obviously, as evidence, we know that all of these organisms, like dinosaurs, used to live on Earth. Um, we can sort of even now study the DNA that we find in fossil remnants. Um, homologous structures, for example, this is a human arm. This is a cat's forelimb. 
a whale's flipper, and a bat wing. Okay, we are all mammals, by the way, so we are similar in that sense. But in this case, you can see color code that we have all the same exact bones. They're just uh, different shapes and different sizes, but they're even used for the same thing. In this case, we use our arms for movement. The cat uses its front limb for movement. The whale uses a flipper for movement, and so does the bat uses it for flying. Even the fingers are there, like one, two, three, four, five fingers. Even the whale has a thumb right there, okay? It's just kind of gotten shorter over time. The cat's fifth little digit is back here now. But, you know, everything's kind of used for the same purpose. So that is some of the evidence we have. Uh, we can play this peppered moth game if you would like to help you understand how camouflage is such an important adaptation. Um, scientists believe that adaptations, natural selection, and mutations have led to and are still causing evolution. Evolution is so slow that, yes, humans will evolve in the next million years. We might not even exist anymore as we do today. Uh, obviously, we have, you know, primitive ancestors that were human-like, um, Homo neanderthal, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and they are extinct now. So, but they are our primitive human ancestors. They're kind of like our evolutionary cousins. So we are still evolving, but it happens so slowly that in our lifetimes, we will never actually see the result of our evolution. Now, what do these pictures show us? This is what a whale used to be 55 million years ago. It kind of walked around like a dog slash rat. And now here is modern whale today. All right, so 55 million years, the whale, as we know, walked on land. How do we know it walked on land? It has a pelvis. It still has a pelvic bone, and that is a vestigial structure. Vestigial structure, for example, another example of... Um, of evidence that we have is the vestigial structures. Um, we have an appendix in our bodies. The whales have a pelvis. Well, we don't use our appendix anymore, but it's there, which kind of proves that our ancestors used to use it. It's for digesting plant material. And a pelvic bone is used for walking. Whales don't walk anymore. They live in the ocean, so they don't need it, but they still have it, which kind of proves that they used to walk. There it is right there, okay? Same thing with a, actually, ignore this. We're not stopping here today. Um, let's get rid of him, too. Okay. Now, modern horse has also evolved. It used to be really, really small, and it had, like, several toes in its feet, and it's kind of uh, merged over the last millions of years, 30 million years, into just one hoof, and it's much bigger. Based on its diet, it's grown in size over time based on, like, what was available to eat. All right. Section four. I'm going to stop here for today and we'll pick up this later.